My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. God, Thank you, Father, for tonight. But we know we'll be instructed by your spirit and by your word. And the, the quality of our lives will be impacted even as we gain levels of transformation that make us become visible expression of your invincible realities. Take all the praise, take all the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Thank you so much. Glory to God. Welcome to Bible studies. I hope you've been learning something. And I hope you've been applying what you've been learning. One of the major hallmarks of Christianity is transformation growing and becoming more and more like Jesus. It's top priority in our walk with God. The things we have, the things we gain eventually are byproducts. Who we become and to what extent we are able to mirror God is far more important than anything we ever possess. And so our focus in a Bible study like this is to bring us light and revelations that helps us gain transformation until we become like the God we serve and the God we profess. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter, chapter 4 from verse 11, it said to some he gave to be apostles, to some he gave to be prophets, to some he gave to be evangelists, to some he gave to be pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry until we all come to the knowledge of the faith, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the fullness of the stature of Christ. So becoming like Christ is the emphasis of our work in time you cannot do anything for God beyond how much of God you have or the degree to which you look like God and this subject we are dealing with particularly helps us understand the strange wisdom of this age that tries to mimic what God is doing and sabotage the effect and the impact getting you to a place of so much activities but a very gross lack in resemblance of God. And at the end of the day, when you journey out of time, you may just realize if God doesn't help you that you wasted your existence. But that will not be your portion. And so last week we began considering this subject, the operations of the spirit of the age. And there were four major things I brought to our understanding. Number one, that God Almighty is not absolutely in charge of the things happening in the world. There is another God controlling things in this realm. If you study 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 3 to verse 4, 
the Bible makes us to understand clearly. It says, if our gospel be heed. Remember, the Bible said in Romans 1, 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. But this powerful gospel that engenders salvation, the Bible is telling us there is a dark mystery that makes this gospel to be hid to some. And he said, those ones to whom the gospel is hid, they are lost. And he said, the reason the gospel is hid to them and the reason they are lost is because even though God desires to save them, he said, the God of this world has blinded their eyes. And so why God is laboring so hard to save people, there is another God with the designation of being the God of this age, blinding the hearts of men. And so there are people on whom's life the effort of God will be futile. Those ones are lost because there is another God ruling over this age. In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, he calls him the prince of the power of the air that controls the minds of the sons of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air. So when you see people walk in lawlessness and rebellion, there is a being manipulating them. He's called the God of this age. Many are not aware. They just assume what we be, we be. <laughs> what we be, we not be. Even your character will not be. Unless you insist. Because there is a God that can manipulate the activities in the earth realm. In John chapter 9, Jesus walked into the temple and they saw a man that was born blind. And the disciples said, who sinned that this man was born blind? Is it, is it the man's fault or is it the fault of his parents? Jesus said, nay. Neither the man nor his parents have a hand in what is happening to him. This predicament is an orchestration of a prince. He said, but I am come. The reason I came is so that in delivering this man, the father can take the glory. That means sicknesses, diseases, oppression, and all forms of backward experiences of men glorifies the devil. Because everybody, including the God you serve, wants you to enjoy the best of life. And if you are not enjoying the best of life, it means there is another prince standing and telling God that I insist that this person will not succeed. I insist that this person will not have the best of life. So every life that is being broken and battered glorifies another being. And every life that is walking glorifies God. And so Jesus said that the Father may be glorified. He said, I must walk the walk of him that sent me while it is day. All of that is to make you know that there is another God controlling things in this realm. God is not the only person in charge. God decided from the foundation of the world to share his authority with man. And man decided to give that authority to the prince of this world. So even though God is sovereign because he has decided to share his rulership authority over the earth realm with man and man willfully and willingly gave it to the devil. There's nothing God can do about it until the story of man comes to an end. That authority remains with the devil. He's called the God of this world. And number two, I made us understand last week that this God of this age has made this age become an evil age. And so at best, what God can do is to deliver you from this age. If it's for this world, forget it. It has been concluded. He said the elements of the earth will melt. The elements of this world will be destroyed because this world has become an evil age. And so in Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, the Bible said Jesus gave himself. He died for you and I that he may deliver you from this evil age. And I told you the word age is the word aeon. And the word aeon is a time frame in which reality is embodied. So when the word aeon is used in scripture, it speaks of a duration in which a purpose or a reality is embodied. And so he's telling us that this particular age in which the existence of man is trapped has been corrupted. And he said it's called an evil age. That means if you are walking in this world, for you to live righteously, you must take advantage of the grace of God. It is no longer possible to naturally live righteous. Just the same way you don't need to cultivate plants 
cultivate grass for it to grow and blossom. That's how evil blossoms in this age naturally. You want to plant a flower, you must labor to get manure. You want to plant crops to feed on, you will labor on it with manure, water it. Sometimes you may even need to bring experts to make that plant work. But wait until the grass begins to grow. The more you try to kill it, the more it blossoms. That's how it is in this age. Evil blossoms naturally. If you want to live the God life in this age, you must contend by the instrumentality of grace and the Holy Spirit. Because this age is an evil age. And then the third thing I told us is that there is good news. Because this age will not continue forever. This age will come to an end. The Bible told us clearly that at the end of the age, God will gather his own out of it. So this age will come to an end. And I also went further to make us understand that the ones with the power to bring this age to an end is the church. Because the Bible said in Psalm 24 verse 14, it said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached. Then shall the end of the age come. That means when this world will end, it will depend on the degree and the urgency with which we engage kingdom service. It's our kingdom service that will determine when wickedness will come to an end. It's our kingdom service and kingdom labors that will determine when the government of God will ultimately be exalted as supreme. If we relax, evil continues. If we relax, wickedness continues. Because the power to bring this aid to an end has been wielded to the church. When the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world, then the power of the age will come to an end. So if you want the evil in the life of a man to come to an end, bring him the gospel of the kingdom. Because there is a time when the effect of the age will end in an individual and there is also a time when the effect of the age will end collectively for everybody. When the gospel goes to every nation of the world, the power of the age will cease. But when the gospel of the kingdom enters a man's life, the power of the age in that, man, that man's life ceases. So whether the age we cease in individuals or collectively, it's all a function of the dissemination of the gospel of the kingdom. And so the reason we are teaching these kinds of subjects now is because we want for now, let the power of the age cease in your life. While we are also striving collectively, to see that the gospel gets to the ends of the earth and the power of the age sees in our world. Is that clear? So if the gospel of the kingdom comes into your life, the power and the influence of the age will cease in your life. So if these things I will be sharing tonight still finds expression in your life, it means respectfully now, you may theoretically know the kingdom, but you don't experientially know it. Because what I want to share now are the operations of the spirit of the age. Last week, I took out time to speak to us about deception as one of the operations of the spirit of the age. And when I took time to expound on the subject of deception, I hope you realize that every one of us, Kai, hey, 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 Ali ahe he Ali ahe he Do you see why God is not moved by titles? <laughs> because if God begins to weigh men in the balances of eternity, you will be shocked how light bishops will be on the scales, bishops bishops some bishops will be light like paper and they will say ah i thought you were a bishop when we when the overcomers are away titles are removed and if you find some of us when titles are removed we'll be like chaff an apostle will come with with so much title and a huge cross they will now say ah servant of jesus come to the way the scales of balances but when he wants to climb they will now remove the apostolic Apostle will now come like skeleton. You will discover that Kai, the age has eaten deep into the apostolic. <laughs> we share things like this so you will know the things that truly matter. And it will determine the direction of your pursuit in life. Because, you know, because of the age, 
we are pursuing the wrong things. And so the first thing I spoke about was deception. I told us deceptions are regulated by spirits, they are regulated by men, and they are regulated by circumstances. I said when deception is regulated by a spirit, it uses tools of worry, ego, ambition, and ignorance. When deception is peddled by men, he uses tools of exaggeration. He uses tools of lies. He uses tools of deliberate misinterpretation of facts. And he uses tools of heresy. When deception is orchestrated by circumstances, he uses tools of high-mindedness. He uses tools of vanity and irreverence for God. When you are able to overcome these things, you will discover that deception will no longer have a foothold in your life. And the seal for living above deception is understanding and discernment. You know exactly what impresses God, you know what moves God, and you pitch your tent there. And because you have discernment in whatever guise the prince of this world or men come, you can pick out what is of God and what is not of God. And because you are dead to most of these things, it will be easy for you to take your crown and stand with God. This is the emphasis of Christianity in the last day, that men will overcome the powers of this age and live in the reality of the ages to come. And tonight, again, we want to look at another operation of the spirit of the age. And the one we'll look at tonight, are, I gave you seven of them, right? So tonight we'll look at self-preservation. By the time I finish this course, please take time to listen to the messages again. I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to read the scriptures. It may be slow, but I want you to get them. And then when you go home, study it again. The Bible said the Berean Christians were more noble than those from Thessalonica. Because when they heard the word of God, they went to search the scriptures to see if the things that were said were so. You know, on Sunday we were on a volatile range. This one is Bible study. Please take it, go and study it, check the scriptures for yourself, read them. And in areas where you are found wanting, ask God for grace so that you realign yourself and begin to live it consciously. You will know why in eternity, even if you don't in time. I assure you, you will know why. Praise God. And so tonight, we want to consider the subject of self-preservation. I saw a quote somewhere and I wrote it because it defines majorly the reason people become victims of self-preservation. And this is what he says. He says, if we suffer the trauma of abuse, early social rejection, social isolation, or bullying, our capacity to engage in independence, our capacity to engage in interdependence with a sense of safety and wholeness can be damaged. If we suffer from traumas of abuse, people who have been raped, people who have been molested, and all of that, or we suffer from social isolation, or we suffer from bullying, or we suffer from social rejection, it is natural for us in the course of engaging with one another not to be able to do it with a sense of safety and with a sense of wholeness. That soulish injury will become a loophole that demons will exploit to engender self-preservation in your life. And so self-preservation fundamentally begins from a soulish injury. You find somebody who is either disabled while he's growing up and then he's bullied by people or isolated by society or you find somebody who is molested and grows with that trauma. When he grows and comes into authority, if he's relating with people, it will be difficult for him to come into that relationship with a sense of security. It will be difficult for him to come into that relationship with wholeness. No matter how he tries, these things will find a way of fighting him. Except God heals that person. These things are called soulish injury. And this is the primary foundation of the disease called self-preservation. When you find men walking as slaves of self-preservation, trace it to the foundation. 
when you look at them, they have one form of deformity or the other. They can use pride to cover up. It's a joke. Come close to them, you will see how strong their humanity is. That, this, that deformation that resulted in social isolation, rejection, bullying, and trauma, if God does not heal them, no matter the revelation, they can even become very manipulative. But those who are close to them know that all of that is a charade. Until God delivers you, you will suffer from self-preservation. You find a man who has been bullied before, everything he's doing, there is a sense of insecurity. He's looking for something because he feels he's a victim. And this is why demons look for such people in order to put them in the trap of self-preservation. So self-preservation is actually a quest. A quest to create a sense of security or wholeness that is inconsistent with the will of God for your life. A quest to create a sense of security or wholeness that is inconsistent with God's ordination for your life. And when I begin to explain this, you will see it that sometimes the ambition to get a position can be self-preservation. Not because it has anything to do with impact or the will of God for your life. I will show you that sometimes even the quest to build a house is self-preservation. None of these things in themselves is wrong. But when it is inconsistent with the will of God for your life and it has become a quest that brings you security and wholeness, know that you are on the plane of self-preservation. Even prayer can become a tool the devil uses to provoke self-preservation in your life. You will check yourself and discover 90% of your prayer is about yourself and your future. You don't care what God is saying about your territory. You don't care what God is saying about others. Every time you pray, you pray because only in prayer do you find security. Something has gone wrong. Self-preservation is a slave. It's a tool that enslaves. And many are slaves of self-preservation. And because of this, they may either lose their reward in eternity or they suffer the risk of disqualification by God. Follow me. Mm. Mm -hmm. ah, hey. Hey, hey, ha. Ah, ha, ha. Ah, ha, ha. My prayer tonight is that God will heal our souls. I can tell you, many people are injured. They are just packaged, walking with a lot of soulish injuries. Heavy soulish injuries. I pray that tonight God will heal our souls. God will heal us. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. I show you how God thinks quickly. And I show you how men who are self-preservant things. Or self-preservative things. 2 Timothy 3 from verse 1 to 5. He said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. You know why he said that? These are the things that activate that sense of insecurity. Perilous times. When there is danger, when there is pressure, a man who is oriented with the principles of self-preservation comes alive quickly. You will see him, you think, let me read. He said, for men shall be lovers of them, their own selves. Their affection, primary affection, turns to themselves. He said they shall be covetous. They want to take everything from everybody. Even if they are vulnerable, it doesn't matter. That's why you see people swindling widows. Widows that should provoke sympathy from even a callous person. A man of self-preservation doesn't care. As far as it translates to his advantage, that's only what he's thinking. He cannot think outside that box. He can even cheat a kid, a young lad, in order to take something for himself. So long as he makes life easy for him, he cannot think outside of that box. That's the only thing he thinks. He can use any advantage he has to, pro to procure that. Be it spiritual, be it mental, be it social, it doesn't matter. So long as he provoke, procures care and comfort for him, that is all. It's called covetousness. Looking out for somebody else's advantage and wanting to take it for yourself. 
regardless of the state of that person afterwards is a protocol this is what is happening in our world today he said they are covetous he said they are boasters so you find somebody show up saying lofty things because until he boasts he can't find security in himself and so when he comes he needs to say something bogus that intimidates the hearer and brings him to a place of comfort it's called self-preservation they are boasters you will see these kinds of things happening in the last day from the pulpit from the government from the media from the economy is happening everywhere because there are too many soulish injuries that are not healed he said they are proud this is taking confidence in something other than god they can tell you what their name represent they can tell you what their resources can do every time you see them speak with confidence and audacity god is not there it's about one thing or the other either the ones they've amassed or the ones they have access to because of somebody they are connected to they are proud people number four he said they are blasphemous when things the chiefs are down they can speak irreverently to god you'll find such people telling god what is even the point of serving you when the chips are down even god becomes too small because why they you see them pursuing god it has nothing to do with relationship when you see them running after god doing the work of god is because they are hoping to use god if it doesn't turn out the way they think they can blaspheme god any day any time did you see the wife of job he said why are you wasting your time cause god and die this condition you are in what kind of god is that that will will, will not take a take care and look at you with the disposition of, of sympathy and compassion come on curse him and, and and get out he said why do you speak like one of the foolish women we don't just serve god because of what he's willing to do or can do whether god chooses to do what he can do or not we are there forever our service to god is beyond what god has to offer because as far as we know he's given us himself already and that is more important than any other thing he can give us but when self-preservation comes we come to god because we want to use god not because we love him not because we want to serve him you find people today they put god at ransom well i have this i want to do for you but until you do this i will never do it that's the generation we are in and when you ask them they call it faith because the people who taught them faith taught them faith through self-preservation and so a man can tell god i'm willing to do this i'm willing to give this but i will not do it until you do this so their relationship with god is a bargain it's the spirit of the age no matter who taught you faith like that is the spirit of the age because if what you do for god is dependent on what god gives you you are not ready to work with god the first book reading, written in the bible is the book of job and it helps you to understand the depths of relationship that we don't relate with god just because of what god gives we relate with god based on who god is and so at the worst moment of your life your loyalty to god is still intact if your loyalty is dependent on what god can do you are not yet ready to serve him number six he said they are disobedient to parents have you seen disregard to authority is born out of self-preservation he said they are unthankful you see why we did our teaching on thanksgiving on sunday these people are people full of ingratitude they are only humble and they are only compliant at the instance when you show them favor give them money see the way they will respect yes sir thank you sir they are full of laughter and joy but when what they are expecting doesn't come true the man that bends down and say yes sir thank you sir suddenly you will see another attitude and you will be shocked that men can change faster than a chameleon when you are giving them things showering them with things they are very obedient very respectful very nice but when those things stop their obedience stop their respect stop suddenly they look at you and say oga <laughs> you, <laughs> you will be shocked ah did you just call me oga yes what do you want me to call you <laughs> what were you what do you want me to call you ah you called me why not <laughs> okay since you don't like that they will now call you by your name peter 
What are you saying? <laughs> you, will, you will discover that that first loyalty you saw was hypocrisy. It was a subtle attitude to get something from you. And because God knows the end from the beginning, he knows these kinds of people. That's why he will never commit himself to them. Unthankful. And he said they are unholy. These ones can't consecrate themselves to God. They consecrate themselves to things. If God meets them at the point of their need, they will embrace God. But any location outside their need, God is on his own. They are only willing to interact with God at the point of their need. Find them praying, it's at the point of their need. Find them giving, it's at the point of their need. Find them serving, sweeping the church, mopping. They are looking for a child. My baby must come this week. My baby must come. I receive my fruit of the womb. I receive it now. Ibaka baka, ibaka baka. The moment fruit of the womb comes, they leave that job for somebody else. I'm telling you why our faith is producing self and not producing God. Because we taught them through the vent of self-preservation. Why do you think they are fighting tight now? Because the whole doctrine of tight is self-preservation. Tight is no longer a sacred thing you commit to God. Tight is no longer something you give to honor God. If you don't give tight, you are cursed. If you don't give tight, the devourer will not be rebuked. If you don't give tight, you are not preserved. And so everybody is running helter skelter. Now that the gospel is beginning to come alive, and people know that with or without tight, the devourer, God doesn't need to rebuke the devourer. Because the power to rebuke the devourer has been given to us in Christ Jesus. And if I realize that I don't need God to rebuke the devourer, in the name of Jesus, I can rebuke the devourer. Then I come back and ask you, that tight you were teaching, what were you saying again? <laughs> you say, if you don't give tight, you are not blessed. I checked, the last time I checked, I was blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I don't know, I'm already blessed. So, what were you saying about that tight again? Because I want to know why. <laughs> because we taught it through self-preservation. And now people are beginning to know the gospel. And because they know that all those things you hinge your doctrine of tight on, it's not true. They are now challenging the concept of tight. I will do a teaching on it, don't worry. I'm not, this one is not an attempt. I'm not making a statement on the subject. I know there's a controversy. I'm not making, I'm not making a statement. I will do my own teaching. Praise God. So these guys are unholy. The Bible said they are without natural affection. They are truce breakers. They break covenants. It said they are false accusers. They are incontinent. They are fierce. They are despisers of those things that are good. It said they are traitors. They are heady. They are high-minded. They are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. That's the summary of self-preservation. And it's an operation of the spirit of the age and you know this thing is hid in the guise it says until perilous time come you won't know that you are one of them it's peri, it's crisis it's pressure that will reveal to you that you are full of yourself and empty of God and when the man is full of himself and empty of God the philosophy of his existence is self preservation forget what he's doing in church he can be the most committed worker in church go and find out why there's something he's trusting God for. The moment he gets that in, service goes down. He can be the most ardent intercessor. Don't be moved because somebody is praying in tongues and is consistent. Find out what is powering and motivating that tongues first. This is why most of the things we do now don't have power in the realms of God. Because when the purpose and the intents are checked, it is all about self. Self-preservation. An operation of the spirit of the age now see how God thinks in Luke 9 23 Jesus said he said and he's and he said unto them all if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me so the way God expects us to walk is to deny ourselves daily and take up our cross daily and follow him Anything other than that is self-preservation. If you can't deny yourself, if you can't take your cross, you are operated by an orientation of selfishness. Your Christianity will have no impact in the realms of eternity. 
You may know doctrines, you may shout it, you may move fire, move all kinds of things, cast out demons. If you don't know how to deny yourself and take your cross, you have no stake in eternity. Because this is how God thinks. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 15, Paul was talking in the same light as Jesus. And he said, and that he died for all. He said, they which live should no longer live unto themselves, but live for him that died for them. They that live should no longer live for themselves. That means anything you are found doing, the first priority should be God. Including the job you are doing now. For Paul was teaching in Ephesians chapter 4, around verse 28. He said, let him that stole steal no more, but walk with his hands that he may have to give. I thought he would say to walk with his hand that he may have to eat. Paul is letting us know there's nothing wrong in eating. He said, but your priority in the scale of things should be first God before self. If you come before God in priority, you are finished. It means the world has overtaken you. So when you walk, God comes first. When you are favored, God comes first. Anything you do, you think God first. If you are going into a political office, you think God first. As I'm going into this office, it will give the church of Christ an advantage. After that, you cannot think about yourself and your people. If it is not God first, you are motivated by self-preservation. You may not know it. Wait until pressure comes. Pressure will tell you where you are standing. And when pressure is done, demons will now show up and make you a slave forever. God comes first. That is the formula for living accurately in the last day. If it is not so, it is self and it is self-preservation. Now, let me explain to you dynamics, the dynamics of self-preservation. I penned down five things here. The first thing that activates self-preservation in the operation of this demonic reality is fear. When a man is about to enter the corridor of self-preservation, the door that opens him to it is fear. And why do people fear? People fear because their assurance is in their own ability. That means they are not yet conscious of the faithfulness and the ability of God over them. So when you find a man who is provoked by fear, he still judges himself based on himself. Now, the moment you come to a point of revelation, experiential knowledge, that your safety is not in you, fear vanishes immediately. I give you a simple illustration. While we were growing up, they told us all kinds of demonic stories that demonic spirits are in the dark. And so you dare not find yourself alone in the dark. When you are alone in the dark, every dark corner looks like a figure. You begin to create imaginations, paint. If you don't hear a sound, if you hear a sound, high BP will begin from there. Every sound should be silenced at that moment. If you hear any sound, the sound will be amplified in your mind as if a demon came out of Hades because of the stories you hear. And then immediately somebody shows up. Instantly, the whole imagination and fear will just dissipate. Not because they have changed the story, but now you feel somebody is there with you. So your confidence and your assurance was primarily in yourself. Now that somebody else has come and you are able to shift your confidence to that person, the fear vanishes immediately. This is how demons lure people into self-preservation. The devil comes and tells you, do you know tomorrow? You mean you won't take these steps now? What happens if this happens, if that happens? But you don't know that the God you are serving is not only in today, he's also in tomorrow. And so every time a man begins to function in self-preservation, he looked away from God and he looked unto himself. And the proof is that fear begins to move him. Every action you take should be motivated by faith. If you want to build a house, let it not be because you are afraid that you don't know what tomorrow holds. Because if the evil of tomorrow comes, you and that your house will perish. If you are saving money, it shouldn't be because you are afraid, because you don't know what tomorrow brings. Don't insult your God like that. If you are saving money, it should be a product of proper planning and financial administration 
for effective dispensation of the things that are a responsibility in your hand. You are not saving money because you are afraid that something may go wrong. No. You are saving money because you want to be effective in kingdom service. You are saving money because you want to be effective in dispensing your life, your life process and your life, your, your, your life ambition and whatever it is called. Don't save out of fear. The moment your operation is born out of fear, something has gone wrong. People go into marriage out of fear. They check their age. They are 25. Ha! They are 26. Ha! They are 27. And anybody that comes, it doesn't matter if God speaks or God does not speak. So long as they are concerned, a man has shown up. And they begin to create care from where care does not exist. The last time, he called me once in two weeks. He's the only person that has remembered to call me. When was the last time he called you? Two weeks ago. When he called me, the way he greeted me, my heart melted. He is a lie. He's fear talking. He's fear talking. And the man feels that, hey, I'm 40 now. If I don't marry, I'm finished. He talks to the lady. The lady snubs him. He says, no, it's her temperament. That's how she operates. She's a very nice person. Interpreting things that don't exist because of fear. Don't marry out of fear. No, self-preservation is a law. It will lure you to death. And when fear begins to rule you, you are in trouble. When fear begins to rule you, something has gone wrong. Check! Every time you take an action, find out. Is it motivated by faith or is it motivated by fear? I will still talk about faith a bit, so let me go forward. Number two, when it migrates from fear, it spirals into ambition. So fear degenerates to ambition. Ambition primarily is building your security apart from God and making your decision not based on impact but based on self-aggrandizement. When you find a man who is ambitious, he is taking his decisions apart from God's will for his life. And number two, he is taking his decision not because he wants to make impact in the lives of people but because he wants to create a sense of security and wholeness for himself. When you operate like that, you're ambitious. Two people can be doing the same thing. One is walking in the will of God. The other one is ambitious. You can find two people in ministry. All of them are winning souls. All of them are traveling everywhere. All of them are fasting and praying. When you check what is motivating one, he is winning souls because God says, this period, he should focus more on soul winning. Somebody else is winning souls because when he looked around, all the people that people are, are honoring are those who are winning souls. So he will quickly start winning souls so that he too will be honored. Doing the same thing but with a different motive. One is following God's calendar, the other one is ambitious. Are you seeing the difference? You find somebody, come somewhere, he starts a business. And as he starts that business, his goal, maybe somebody starts an orphanage in the territory. Because he has seen children wasting away. And that is his or her own way of helping these ones have a future. And then he starts an orphanage. And then somebody has looked and said, ah, he won a grant last month. He has won another grant. And then they told the person that the governor says he's coming to that orphanage next week. Ah, the governor is coming for the orphanage. The next thing, you will now see the God that preserves orphanage international. The other person has started orphanage. Why? Because this one has one grant, the governor is coming, all of a sudden, they are beginning to hail this person as a philanthropist. You too want to be called a philanthropist. So your opening of the orphanage has nothing to do with the children that are wasting. You are not interested in making impact at all. In fact, that person will start that orphanage, you will never come there. Coming there to sit with those children will be a body. If he even makes the mistake of coming there, he is coming with Koboko. He will be there. Any day he's coming, the children will run away. No connection with the children. But he needs to have a title that he has an orphanage. And because he has an orphanage, he's a philanthropist. So why one is doing it to make impact, the other one is doing it for self-aggrandizement. I'm not interested in the children. They can die if they want. But if I open this orphanage, they will recognize me as a philanthropist. Some grants will start coming in and I will gain societal recognition. That's what we call ambition. It has nothing to do with impact. 
But if what you are doing is designed and motivated for impact, even if you give your life for it, it's not ambition. You are motivated by passion. You are motivated by purpose. The difference between purpose and ambition is that purpose is oriented towards impact. Ambition is oriented towards self. So the action is not the problem. And I'm going to say this vehemently because there are many young people today that are becoming mediocre. Why? Because of the doctrine of ambition. God leads you to go to an unreached place and to reach out to them with the gospel. Somebody shows up and say, all oh, these young people who are ambitious, they want to be everywhere. If your focus is not to be called a minister, if your focus is not self-oriented, if your focus is to bring light to a dark place, give yourself there and give your all, no matter what they call it, as far as God is concerned, that's not an ambition. If you are doing it for impact, it's not an ambition. But if you are doing it because of yourself, no, if you like, die there. You are an ambitious person. That's why Paul says, if you like, give your body to be burnt. If it is not motivated by love, he says you have no impact. So the difference between purpose and ambition is that purpose is impact oriented and it is consistent with the will of God for you. Ambition has nothing to do with impact in the lives of people and it has everything to do with you. If what you are doing is based on God's purpose for your life and is based on impact, sir, don't care about whatever anybody says. No matter who they think they are, that's their personal opinion. But if it is oriented towards yourself, stop. You are about to destroy yourself. Because the reason many people start ministry is because they are afraid that if they don't start now, what will tomorrow hold? The reason many people start schools is because they are afraid if they don't start now, what will tomorrow hold? They are not doing it because there is a passion to create a change in society. They are doing it because they are afraid they don't know what tomorrow holds. If you are doing it for yourself, you have wasted your existence. Because what God had in mind to give you, he may just not give it again because your hands will be too preoccupied to do what God has told you to do. You are looking for 10,000 congregations. Do you have love for souls? When was the last time you followed up someone and said, how are you? When was the last time you checked on the crisis of somebody? You have 10 people around you. You don't care about them. But you are looking for 10,000 people. That's ambition. That's not impact. If you are looking for 10,000 people because you have exhausted the people God gave you. And you are trying to reach out to more people. You can get 100,000. And God himself will bring the people. But if he has nothing to do with people, it's just for the show that I see 10,000 people every Sunday and uh, God has helped us. You are a joker. You are a joker. This is the problem we have in our generation. People are jumping up and down. They want to do things because of the injury of their soul. You have 20 people under you. You have not been able to pastor them. But you are looking for 2,000 people. Meanwhile, the 20 people, you can't deal with them in patience, no tolerance, no love, no affection. But you are crying every day asking God, why? Why is this church not growing? The 20 you have, what are you doing with them? You can't handle 20, you are asking God for growth. Growth unto what? Ambition gone on rampage. I was listening to Bishop Oedeko many years ago. He said he was preaching in church and he saw somebody that was not concentrating while they were in Kaduna. After service, he met him. I said, what happened? The guy said, honestly, he's sorry. He didn't follow the service. Why? He said, there was no food at home. He gave all that he had. Forgetting that he too was going to a house. And today you see 200,000 people attend a Sunday service. You say, no, we have the faith to take over the city. We will bring 20. <laughs> Some people preach the doctrine of loyalty until loyalty becomes Jesus because they want everybody to be submitted to them. Meanwhile, they have no love for those people. This same man we are talking about, many years ago, when he just got married, there were seven of them in one room. How can you keep six men with your wife, newlywed? And he said, 5 a.m., everybody leaves the house. And no matter what you are doing, from 4 p.m., no visitors. That's how they ran their lives for over three years. And today, you see people like Bishop Abioye follow him die hard. You say, how can you imagine? Uh, where are the Abioyes of our generation? Do you know the love that he enjoyed from the man? Bishop Abioye slept on bench in Meduguri for over two years. 
But before that level of loyalty was engendered, there was a love that was, was received. He saw when they lived in the same house. Do you know how inconveniencing it is to get married to a young lady and then bring her to live with seven people in one room? That means the early marriage was robbed. He didn't know what it meant to enjoy early marriage. And then today you see men loyal to them. You come and stand on Facebook. You say some men have become gods. They manipulate with you. <laughs> if it's because we're in the era of grace. God would have killed you. And people don't know the truth. They come. Some carry loyalty as a weapon. They preach 30 scripts, 30 messages. 29 is about loyalty. Because they want you to die for them. Meanwhile, do you think people are loyal because you taught, taught them message on loyalty? When they see love in your heart, it provokes their conscience. They cannot. See, dying for you becomes an honor. That's what David did. David went to war with his warriors. David sat together, ate with them. They experienced everything together. When those men died for David, they called it an honor. A comrade spirit was born. Not because he sat down and used scripture to manipulate people into loyalty. No, there was too much love for this man to betray him. There was too much love for this man to compromise. They knew that this man loved them genuinely. When you find ambitious people, they are not interested in impact. You are with them for 10 years. They don't care about the quality of your life. They are only interested in how you will serve them and perform so that all things will look well. And then you are killing people say they are saying they are not loyal. Come on, forget that charade. As you see Bishop Abiyo and Bishop Oedeku, what's the difference? In the same ministry, he ordained himself. He was ordained bishop. He ordained Abiyo as bishop. If he shows up, the quality of his life is the same quality you see in Abiyo's life. So if you cannot love like Oedeko, don't expect a lawyer Abiyo. Ambition, ambition. People using people and then trying to use the gospel to masquerade. In, forget it. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. I saw Pastor Chris and Reverend Tom. They work together like friends. The, the level of commitment is too deep. See, some of these men, what they share is deeper than even what they have with their wives. And then you wonder why people commit themselves. Our dinner, my, my, one of my sons wrote recently, he said, the brotherhood is no longer sincere. The brotherhood, the brotherhood has been compromised. So self-preservation migrates from what? Fear to ambition. People are not interested in others. They just want to use them. And they want to use them because they want to create impression, not impact. And I'm not just talking ministry. Even in your hairdressing saloon. People come, you don't care about their lives. You don't care about, you use them, strain them like donkeys. At the end of the day, it's about you and your saloon. You don't care about the people. It's called self-preservation. At the end of the day, that your saloon will wreck more people than any gain you will ever make. And that's what our world is suffering today. You see one man is a God among one million people. No other person looks like him. Even the so-called people that are assisting him, when you look at them, you wonder whether they are servants. The quality of their lives is a reproach to what the person claims it stands for. Ambition. When you find ambition, know that self-preservation is at work. Number three. Faithlessness. When a man migrates from ambition, he arrives at a point of faithlessness. Everything he's doing is built on his capacity, not on God's capacity through him. So when you find him talk, it's about his intelligence. It's about his certificates. It's about his human connection. And he will do anything to manage it. And check, most of our messages now is about building relationship. And we invoke the principles of Babylon to teach the body of Christ. 
what you need to do to manage this relationship and manage this relationship what you need to do all of that is born out you will now discover that our messages now refines our fleshly abilities and not the ability of god on our inside in the days of the fathers when they taught relationship they taught it from the ground of integrity they taught it from the ground of truthfulness they taught it from the ground of loyalty they taught it from the ground of capacity and competence in our generations today when we teach relationship we teach gifts manipulation that's what we teach we build our relationships on manipulation including marriage you come to marriage seminars and then you see pastors telling people how their wife should dress naked eh, do like this do like principles of babylon did you marry the woman because she was naked Babylon, Babylon. Somebody can outrightly teach you to use a gift and deceive your boss. Even though there's no loyalty, there's no commitment. The same things you will learn from the world. That's what we refine now and teach in church. And then you'll find people saying, Kai, wisdom, Kai, this wisdom, ah, this wisdom, wisdom that turns you to a crook. No commitment, no loyalty. Create impression, win the person's trust. That's what we teach now as relationship. Because we are oriented towards self-preservation. And these are the things that our generation love. The Bible said in the last day, men will heap unto themselves teachers that tell them sweet things. And so after a while, you discover people no longer bank on God. People bank on their human connections because they've taught it. People bank on their mental capacity. People bank on everything apart from God. Meanwhile, Jesus said in John 15, 5, he said, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. In Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. I know you are intelligent. Lean not on your own understanding. That means by all means, strive to know God's will for your life and hear God's voice to take actions. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. He will direct thy path. That's what the Bible teaches. In Jeremiah 17, verse 7 to 8, it says, Blessed is the man who trusted in the Lord, whose trust in the Lord. He is like the tree planted by the waters that sends out its root by the stream and does not fear when it comes. It says, For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought. Even in the year of drought, that man cannot be anxious. In Proverbs 28, 26, he says, Whosoever trusted in his own mind is a fool. But he who walks in the wisdom of God shall be delivered. Whoever trusts in his own mind, the Bible says he is a fool. Because what we teach today and what we do, we bring you to a point where even you know that you are where you are by your hard work. You are where you are by your wisdom. You are where you are by your manipulation. That's why many times, when you take those steps, even if it's against God, you do it all the same. You know that this thing you want to do you, is lies. You know that it's exaggeration. You know it's manipulation. But you will consciously deaden your conscience. Because you know it's not God that is promoting you. It's your manipulative skill that is taking you forward. It is what self-preservation does to a generation. It moves from fear it degenerates to ambition and then it degenerates to a state of faithlessness faithlessness not because you don't know god exists faithlessness because now you live your life based on your own abilities this is the christianity we have today people just call god out of uh, either hypocrisy or religion somebody tells you this thing happening now god is a lie there is nothing he does in his everyday life that suggests he depends on God. The proof that you depend on God is defined by the weight of your consecration. And your consecration affects every aspect of your being. You claim your job is God. What is the weight of your consecration as touching your job? 
This is why nowadays, people look for people to pray on their behalf and prophesy to them. Why they go face their job and service those people with money to keep prophesying over them. But it's only in Christianity you find this fallacy. If a governor belongs to a court, to an old court, if they are fasting, if it's 90 days, he knows he will not dare skip it for one day. He knows. He will not dare show up and say, I'm governor. He knows he cannot try it. That they caught, they are fasting for 90 days. And then you say, sorry, I was busy. You, you, even you know you can't try that. It's only in church you can try those nonsense. Or they say there is a meeting here. And then you come late that you are minister. Or you are senator. You know you can't try that. You know. Or they say they, they have um, a, a ritual, a giving. And it's your, it's your timetable to give. <laughs> Even you, you know that if that thing is not yet available, you can't sleep. You, you, you know. It's only in church that people come and we tie to that they are governors. Because we don't know the, 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 the powers of consecration. Because we are not actually promoted by God. We just use God as a charade. Self-preservation has eaten deep into the fabric of our operation. And this is why the devil is no longer afraid of the church. Because he knows that 90% of the people praying or doing whatever it is they are doing, they are puppets. He can bargain them any day, any time. Number four, when you deteriorate to faithlessness, then finally, you deteriorate to selfishness. And the heaviest thing about selfishness is that you cooperate with God only to use Him. When it comes to that level, then it's terrible. At the kindergarten level of selfishness, you can cooperate with people to use them. But when it deteriorates to a point where even God, you cooperate with Him to use Him, know that you are, you are a grandmaster in selfishness. But this is where self-preservation brings people. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 21, this is God's expectation. He said for, this is what God discovered about men. He said for all seek their own, not the things that belong to Christ. God has come to that conclusion now that everybody shouting, singing and praising, they came for their own. It has nothing to do with him. God knows. Is he the worshiper? Is he the dancer? Is he the prayer warrior? Is he the apostle quoting scripture? He is there for himself. He has nothing to do with me. In fact, nowadays, it's more marketable when you use God. And so people use the name of God to achieve their own ambition and gain. In 2 Timothy 3 verse 2, he said, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient, unthankful. And in verse 5, they said, they don't love God. So a point comes where people are praying, but they are not in relationship with God. A point comes, people are fasting, they are not in relationship with God. A point comes, people are giving, they are not in relationship with God. They are only there to use God. They taught them that if you give, it will be given unto you. Is it true? So they tried. It happens. Ah. The next time, they give more. They now told them, <laughs> if you give, you either receive 30 fold, 60 fold, or 100 fold. So now, when they want to give, they garnish their giving with prayer so that they will not receive 30 fold. They want to receive 100 fold. And God just stands behind and is looking for the generation. Even the things of the spirit, they have perverted it so much that God himself is shocked at the ingenuity of a crafty generation. Somebody wants to give. What is, come, what is invoking is hundredfold. And he has come to the level where normally he can get thirtyfold. But he wants to upgrade to hundredfold. So sometimes he even garnishes with fasting. He will put the money on the table in the, in the room and pray around it for two hours. This seed is productive. And to make it worse, 
They now teach us to give to fruitful ground. So don't give to the poor. The poor is not a fruitful ground. Better give it to a church. And if you are giving to a church, wait, check. Find out what is the size of the congregation. Is it up to 20,000? That is a sign that the anointing there is working. If you go and give your money to a church that is 20, you are, now, you are, you, that's your business. Because that's not a faithful ground. That ground is a dry ground. Or you want to give, they check, it's miracle, a miracle is happening there. So you want to go and cast your seed where there's no hope. Bro, be wise. Be wise. In the last days, wisdom is profitable to direct. Meanwhile, in the days of old, in the days of old, the concept of giving was twofold. Go and check the whole New Testament. Number one is to create equity. That's why they gave in the New Testament, to create equity. He said there was none among them that lacked. And number two is to advance God's kingdom. These were the two things that motivated their giving apart from love for God. So in the, in the early church, they would rather give to a church that is struggling than to give to a church that is prosperous. Because the work of God here is suffering and they want to upgrade it. But our selfish generation, they call that place dry ground. And they don't only give, to, they don't only avoid dry ground, they also avoid the poor. Meanwhile, the Bible said, him that lended to the poor, lended to the Lord. But they don't have a relationship with God. Why do they care? Self-preservation. Do you see why when you bring your seed to church, even though you see this brother praying every day here, yeah, 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 you will wait for until the apostle comes. I am the only person you want to give your seed. Because when you check, you perceive that the center of the ministry is with this man and he seems to be more anointed. And the brother who is doing, haba, haba, even the son that he's wearing while leading prayer is already torn. You will never be moved to say, sir, please, God bless you. Never. You see 100 people queue up. They want to give to apostles. And the one they give, they touch you here. They touch here. They touch here. They have carried something. <laughs> Selfishness and self-centeredness. I am not the only minister here, sir. Somebody is praying here. That's why the atmosphere is created. How many of you have walked to the wire person and said, Hi, ah, I was blessed. Please take this seed. Just to encourage the person. Never. You will never give her a seed to encourage her. You want all your seed to come to the apostle. Because you are hoping that the last testimony you heard, they said somebody gave, he gave a prophetic word. So now you are waiting for a word. You are waiting for a word. And so church becomes a pyramidal system. All the testimony must be about the set man. Everybody must call the name of the set man. So that anything happening will only happen around the set man. It's called Ponzi skin. I'm not the only anointed person here, sir. And I'm not the only person laboring here. And you don't only give to receive a prophetic word. Sometimes give to the usher to encourage the person. You came here for three months and every day you saw that person on duty. Encourage that person. It's called brotherly love. Self-preservation. The oppression of this age and even when God's servant received the seed it will never go around God's servant is the only one who is called and church started all of them were friends after 10 years God's servant becomes a demigod others become servant because he will make sure he will create that gap and it will be very clear to know who is in charge meanwhile when God was accusing the sons of Levi, this is why he accused them. The Malachi 3.2 that we always quote is not for the members. It's for the high priest and the Levites. Tight comes in. You, 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 you milk tight out of everybody and you keep it for yourself. And others are struggling. Others are in pain. Man of God is changing suit every day. Every other pastor comes up with rag. Pathetic. Do you 
now see that even the world system is more just than the church now? When you go to the hospital, if the MD show up and the deputy show up, you can't tell the difference. Because they, they ensure that the salary structure is designed in such a way that everybody will take something home. The world system is more righteous. Make sure you don't choke those who work under you. Make sure. Make sure. If not, your Christianity is fake. It's fake. Your Christianity is fake. I started paying salary from the first month. For those who are working. Even among the volunteers, there are some we check. We discover that Kai, this volunteer can't pay transport. The person wants to serve God, but Kai, even transport fare to come and serve God is not there. We conscript them and start paying them. Something, at least enough. Self-preservation is killing what God is doing. And we stand up and claim we preach all the kingdom and the kingdom will never reflect in the life of people. It's the spirit of this age. Selfishness. And this is why you see many people love the world and forsake Christ. In 2 Timothy 4.10, he said, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. The guy came to church, gave his all, but he checked. After two years, he discovered that car. The work he was doing in the, the work he was doing in the hospital was more effective. He rather served God from the hospital. The salary is not paid. It's not up to minimum wage. And you must pay tight, pay first fruit, <laughs> and give prophetic seed. The week they give you offering, pastor will start watching everybody like this. I didn't see your tight. When last did you give your first fruit? Have you given any prophetic seed? The 10,000 they pay you, you will give church 7,000 back. <laughs> The guy will say, please, I will go and be a cleaner somewhere. At least that one I can pay. I will pay my tithe out of it. <laughs> it looks funny, but this is why we are powerless. I'm telling you. This is why we are weak. This is why the world is ridiculing the church. May God help us to be right. Oh. May God help us. Because it's, be, it's harder done than said. So the dynamics of self-preservation, it begins with fear, it spirals into ambition, it spirals into faithlessness, and it finally culminates into full-blown selfishness. Everything becomes about yourself. Now, see the danger. Time is flying, so I'm trying to cut off some things. Should I cut off some things? Dangers of self-preservation. Number one. Proverbs 21 verse 13. I'll keep it brief now. It says, Whoso stopped his ears at the cry of the poor, 
He shall also cry himself, but shall not be heard. So self-preservation exonerates you from divine intervention. Because you are insensitive to others and only sensitive to yourself. He said, when you also need intervention, you won't find it. So a man who wants to live for himself will actually be separated to live for himself. If you want intervention in your life, you must first of all begin to, begin to intervene in the lives of others. If you don't know how to intervene in the lives of others, no matter how you cry, no matter the tongues you speak, no matter how bogus your message is, you will be left in a dry land. You too will not receive intervention. He said, if you block your ears to the cry of the poor when you cry, you know what it means? Oh, one day all of us will cry for something. And that day you cry desperately seeking intervention. He said, that day the ultimate ear too will be shut off from you. So the first danger of self-preservation is exoneration from divine intervention. Number two, second danger of self-preservation. Proverbs 28, 27. He said, he that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall walk in a curse. So the second danger of self-preservation is that you are sentenced perpetually to the path of lack. Find out people who are selfish and self-centered. Their lives reduces continuously until they spiral into nothingness. The Bible said, the libra soul shall be made fat. It says, him that watereth shall by himself be watered unto. You don't give because you have the resources. You actually give because you have the heart. And a man who does not have the heart to give can never find help. His path is already littered with lack. He may not see it. The little he has will soon finish. And when he finishes, he will see how he has hedged himself into nothingness and into oblivion. Number three, danger of self-preservation. Haggai chapter 1 verse 9. He said, Ye look for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew upon it. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because my house is a waste, and you run away unto your own. Hope I told you that when self-preservation is fully blown, people use God. So when God's house is in lack, not just your neighbors now, even God, when his house was in lack, you turned away and went to find your own comfort. He said, when that happens, even the one you have, I will blow on it until your hands become empty. So the third danger of self-preservation is that it causes you to constantly reduce and not increase. So you find the man who is hedging to himself. Watch him. Time will prove to you the direction he's going to. No matter the investment, no matter the strategy, he will constantly reduce. The forces of nature will fight him and God himself will fight him. He said this person is so selfish that he is not just insensitive to his neighbors. He said, even the house of God, he's insensitive there. He said, therefore, the things he labored legitimately to gather, you work hard, you are diligent. He said, when you take it home, I will blow on it. And from nowhere, you will find hospital bills will take 40% of your money. Accident, take 30%. And you are wondering, what is going on? The, a wind is being blown into your hand. This is what happens to these people. They only think self, 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 money till night, self. And so in order to help them look in the direction of God, he blows it off their hands. Number four, danger of self-preservation. Proverbs 26 verse 12. It says, seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? He said, there is no hope for that. He said, there is more hope for a fool than that man. A man who is wise in his own acts and treachery. He said, a fool has more hope than that man. Do you know who a fool is? The Bible says, a fool said in his heart, there is no God. That means a godless man has more hope than a man who works in self-preservation. So the fourth danger of self-preservation is that your future is unpredictable. No matter how beautiful and rosy it looks today, forget the future of a fool is better than your future. That's why you can't afford to live in selfishness. Have you not seen all these wicked, wealthy men? 
that exploit the poor, exploit the masses, and gather the money for themselves. The moment they die, after two years, their children want to go to Dubai and to Bahama Island. They will be doing birthday in a private jet. Sometimes they will do birthday in three jets. After two months, the whole money will vanish. That means the man's 60 years of embezzlement was a wasted life. That's why I said there's no hope for a fool. But the man... Okay, let me read Proverbs 28 for you quickly. Proverbs 28 verse 20. He said, but the man that through faithfulness and diligence grows. He said, that man. He said, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. He that maketh haste to reach shall not be innocent. That means the man who follows the way of God, the way of diligence and generosity. He said, that man's end is blessings. But this one that is full of himself, after he gathers, he said it will be like an ostrich that lays an egg and don't sit on it and leaves it to be destroyed. That is how the end of that man will be. All this self-centeredness, selfish and self-oriented mentality, it has no end with God. It's not the way of the kingdom. And I will show you the way of the kingdom shortly. The fifth danger of self-preservation is ultimate rejection by God. God himself will reject you. 1 Samuel 15, verse 3. See what happened to King Saul. It's a long reading. I can't read it. God himself picked him as a king. But the point came, the guy became so self-centered. He didn't even bother about God anymore. Okay, maybe I read it. Let me read it so you just get the story. He said, God now spoke through Samuel to King Saul. He said, now go and smite the Amalek, Amalek and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not. Slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, sheep, camel and asses. That's 1 Samuel 15 verse 3. From verse 8 to verse 15, see what happened. He said, when Saul went and smote the people, he said, number one, he took Agag, the king of, Am of the Amalekites, and utterly destroyed the people with the edge of the sword. He said, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattings and of the lambs and all that was good and they did not destroy them. Everything that was vile and they, ref they refused and utterly destroyed. But all the good things they kept for themselves against the commandment of God. That's what self-preservation does. You think self so much that God becomes small to you. Now see what happened. In verse 10, he said, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from me, for he had not performed my commandments. And he said, The thing grieved Samuel, and he cried and prayed all night. Verse 12, he said, When Samuel arose early in the morning to meet Saul, he said, he told it to Saul, saying, he said, and when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told to Samuel, saying, Saul came to Camel, and behold, he set himself upon a place, and he's gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. That means Saul went to Gilgal. Summary. And Samuel came to Saul. The moment Saul saw him, you see why I said you are wise in your own conceit. The moment Saul saw him, see what he said. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. He began to hear the prophet of God. Salutations, dear prophet of Jehovah Elohim. <laughs> and Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in my ears? The guy doesn't have time for human applause. He came on a mission. He is not a man who is moved by salutations and gifts. Why am I hearing the bleating of the sheep? Hear Saul. And Saul said, They, not me, the people became king. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared of the sheep <laughs> and of oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord. The reason we collected this bribe is because we want to advance God's kingdom. <laughs> Lord, your church needs to move forward. 
That's why we did a bit of exaggeration. How can the people of the born woman only be making money? God is not looking for a thief to advance his kingdom. We gathered all of this so that we can sacrifice to the most high God. How can our God not be, be, receive a worthy sacrifice? You go and steal two billion from government coffers and then you bring tight of 200 million. You say, well, I had a burden for the evangelism. I'll keep your money, sir. Keep your money. God is not looking for thieves to advance his kingdom. I, I had the body. You know when they spoke about the evangelism, I say I will buy all the equipment. If God needed help, he won't ask you. Church is not looking for donation. What we give are offerings. Because it's an act of worship. And the offering is accepted when your life is first of all accepted. Look at what God did to him. Samuel began to talk to him. And the Lord sent thee from verse 18 on a journey and said, Go, utterly destroy the sinners. Wherefore then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? But you have flied upon the spoil and you have done evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 21. When Samuel turned to go, Saul held him. Don't embarrass me before the people. Even if God has rejected me, at least show me respect as king. Are you seeing self-preservation? When they told David that God was angry with him, he tore his garment, poured ashes on his head, and fell on the ground, and wept from morning to night. They told King Saul, God has rejected you. He was more conscious about the elder. Let's do some level of diplomacy here. We don't need to, to show everybody that something is wrong. Calm down. Calm down, prophet. Calm down. Prophet, calm down. We can settle this. They say God has rejected you. You are thinking of the people. And so told, Samuel told him, God has rejected you. When Samuel wanted to go, he held his garment and he tore. Ah! And Samuel now entered his prophetic authority. This one, God didn't say it. But I want to talk, tell you, I'm a prophet. The ones God say, we hear. And the ones we say, God hears. Did you know here, he said, the Lord confirmed the words of his servant. He performs the counsels of his messenger. He said, see, your kingdom has been torn. So self-preservation ultimately leads to rejection. Ultimately, that's the danger of self-preservation. A point comes, you are a global singer, but God has rejected you. Because all your life you were singing for Norelio. And so you turn down the small meetings and accept the big meetings. And you collect the money. After four years, you are still singing. But God has taken your voice. And you don't know why the glory is no longer there. And you are wondering what happened. God has rejected you. After God rejected King Saul, he was still on the throne for a long time. But he was sitting on, a, on, a, on, a, on an aisle. The glory had gone. God had met, met somebody else who is in the wilderness. Because God doesn't need a palace. Anywhere he is, is heaven. Many have been rejected. That business you are doing, you've cut corners for too long. Because you want to build a house. And building a house is your greatest pursuit. And you can cut corners, you can sabotage, you can compromise to build the house. An undiscerning pastor will come and say, we we'll consecrate this house in the name of the Lord. And take his seed and go away. You will give that seed and it will be big, but God has rejected you. This is what the spirit of the age is interested in. That you come to a point where God will reject you even while you are calling on his name. And when you get to eternity, you say, Lord, we cast out devils in your name. You say, away, away from me, thou that walk in iniquity. You don't know you were rejected 30 years before you left the earth. I rejected you 40 years before you left the earth. I know they eventually ordained you a bishop. But I, I rejected you when you were a deacon. So that thing you call promotion from deacon to pastor to bishop to archbishop, it was among men. In the realm of the angels, the man to left to a boy in the wilderness. Ah, did you notice that they started hearing that boy's voice even though he didn't have a platform? I left you. The authority left. You only had decorations. 
That's what happens to men. There's a governor that I know. If you call him to say good afternoon, he will begin from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pasture. The other time they did a biannual PFN conference. When this governor came to speak, he carried the mic and he started weeping. Ah, a man of 60, of over 60, is that how easy it is to cry? He wept for two seconds. They now say, he said, okay, fine. The tears are dried up. Tears came out and dried up in seconds. The next thing he started, he began to quote Psalm 23. He quoted the whole chapter of hand. When he finished quoting, he started prophesying. Meanwhile, that governor did. He has not paid salary for 13, 13 months. If you call him anywhere and say, greet us, he will say Proverbs 22 verse 4. <laughs> the whole Bible is in his head, but his heart is the heart of a thief. <laughs> That's how much. When he came, <laughs> if you hear his titles, <laughs> you will run. Hear titles. He is, if he carry, if he teach this thing I'm teaching now, you can't sit down. He's a more accurate biblical exegist. The biblical intelligence is too much. But the state, <laughs> people are done. He has no salary is not paid. Pensioners will come and sit down, and some of them will die. Some of them will die. Meanwhile, he has assets in different countries. Look, he has too much revelation. When you bring a cause, he will invoke mercy. He will invoke mercy. <laughs> and then he can lie down now and say, Lord, a contrite heart, thou shalt not despise. <laughs> he knows the revelation is too much. <laughs> and there are many in different states in this country. Are you not seeing people betraying their king's men boldly? A Christian will stand up and say, well, and what is wrong with that? Ah, your, your faith is being sabotaged. You will stand up and say, hey, what, what is the meaning of that? Ah, because of the little, little, little money. Self-preservation. It makes men become dead. And so God rejects such people. We are out of time. It's a body. Some of these teachings, you don't know how to say it. It's a body. Because if God doesn't even show you, it won't mean much. That's the problem. Because as we step out here now, many will start it again. We have become so callous. Nobody cares about the other person anymore. So long as I can eat, it's fine. So long as I can drink and rest, it's fine. Where are we going to? And then we are shouting the name of Jesus like a trumpet and shouting revival, screaming all kinds of things. I wish I had time to show you the powers of self-preservation. What self-preservation writes on. And then you will begin to x-ray and see that even the church, unless God intervenes, there's no hope. What people carry do with this microphone? Okay, three minutes. Let me just state some things out. Number one, powers of self-preservation. Fear and insecurity. You want to find where self-preservation operates without any form of impediment where there is insecurity and you will see the attributes pulling others down egoistic exaggeration subtle manipulation and crafty diplomacy these are the these are the weapons when a man has insecurity you will find these four things happening and these four things will happen because he wants to at the end of the day be without heart he can come and pull somebody down and destroy the person. So long as destroying that person makes him, makes him comfortable where he is, it doesn't matter. 
that person can be wrecked, he will even be happy about it. That's what's going on now in the body of Christ. And that's what's happening everywhere. People antagonize people, pull them down, campaigns of calumny, all kinds of evil. They heap it on other people to appear dark. Meanwhile, the danger of it is that if God leaves somebody, you can't pull him down. The problem is that the people who are your followers, you are darkening their souls. After many years, they will never grow. And so you will end up self-destroying what you should have shepherded. Campaigns or calumny. Trying to ridicule people, trying to destroy people. Every other person is wrong. Only you is correct. Know that insecurity has taken a throne there. Number two, egoistic exegesis. You find 90% of the conversation is about inflating themselves to appear big in your eyes. And then they build this momentum around themselves so much that you can't even come close. Have you not? Some of the things, times you come close to people, you are doing like this. It's not, it's not anointing. It's not glory. It's a momentum built around them through exaggeration. A man tells you things. Every other apostle is a failure. He's the only correct person. Every other prophet is a baby prophet. He's of the, of the realms of Abba. He talks about nation. Every other politician is fake. He's the only accurate politician. And so when you come around them, you become like Isaiah that saw the glory of God and you start cursing yourself. <laughs> Egoistic exaggeration. Even very simple thing to say it the way we will route it. It will look as if we, we sleep in heaven. Insecurity is at work. When things are overblown, it's to create oppression. And that's why people from the West hardly listen to African preachers. The drama is too much. You are saying, for God so loved the world. Say it. That's what he says. Before you say, for God so loved the world, you first of all show how you love the world. In fact, you love the world more than God. So as they are seeing God, they are seeing you. If they don't see you where they see God, the message is not complete. You must exaggerate things until you appear so big and you will never state that you make mistakes in your life. People like you never make mistakes. Every other person is wrong until you show up. You are the only accurate person and you are always accurate. It's insecurity. Number three is subtle manipulation. When you hear such conversations, you will know what is behind it if you have discernment. Because two messages are being pushed at the same time. Somebody shows up and is telling you why you should give. And while he's telling you why you should give, he's threatening you. If you don't give, what will happen to you? And when he's done threatening you successfully and he sees that he has gotten you where you, he wants, he now casually begins to explain to you some of the things they are doing. If you want to, you can be a part of it. If you don't want to, no problem. Here, we don't force people. <laughs> so you have forced people with a gun already. You have already enslaved them with a chain. Here, we don't force people. With all that threat, and you know the person doesn't know as much as you do. After you have put threat and blockade the person into fear, you now say, if you feel like, if you don't feel like, please, don't. You, you know here we don't force people. No, you don't force people here. You kill people here. <laughs> and then number four is crafty diplomacy. Every statement is so guided. You can never fought. You can't find any offense. Even when they are obviously angry, they will, it's about, they are so conscious about what people think. So the tongue is so sweet. They manage the war so much so that you can never find offense. It's self-preservation. That's why some people, you will never hear them call sin, sin. You will never hear them tell people about judgment because you can't be offended. Somebody is naked, obviously a distraction to the whole church. They begin to quote it. They quote it. They paint it. They diplomatically say it. They apologize a million times. Orgasa, 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 orgasa. God is not only Elohim. He's also called Jehovah, Sabaoth. 
sometimes it comes with vengeance. And if you don't address certain things, the souls of men can never receive the truth. But when you find self-preservation, they don't want to offend anybody. Everybody must speak well of them. The Bible says, woe unto you if all men speak good of you. There are certain truths, you confront people with it. Confront them with it and state it. We have become so political, even on the altar, they will never give you a stand on any subject because they are careful not to hurt anybody. Are you for gay or against gay? Well, you see, um, some of these issues is psychological some people have issues uh, we need to check the psychological aspect and some of these things uh, is demonic we need to help the people are you against gay or are you for gay is gay a sin or not don't bring a thesis if you want to do a phd study on it go to the university the question is are you for or against <laughs> because they don't want the gay community to attack them and they don't want the Christian community to attack them. So they are talking like this. The other day I saw an interview on the internet. They said, Jesus said, I am the way. Does that mean he's the only way? And he said, no, you know, um, the, the love of God is so massive. Um, what Jesus meant is, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, uh, is this thing so hard? You know, God loves everybody. Uh, you huh. <laughs> You will hear a preacher talking, you say, ah, if we can't find the truth on the altar, where else should we go? Because everybody must speak well of you. Woe unto you if men speak good of you. There are certain truths, you will say it, half of the people following you will turn back. When Jesus preached certain messages, everybody turned back. He looked at the disciples, are you going to? Because if you wish to go, let me start looking for other people. I want to know. I want to know if I should start getting new disciples. You can't hear truth anymore because of self-preservation. Crafty diplomacy. Even when truth is in contention, they will rather betray truth than to state it because they want to be accepted in every quarters. Number two, weapon that self-preservation rides on is bitterness. Remember, I told you, people who are easily used of demons in operating this dimension are people that had issues in their earlier days that created a soulish injury. Most of them left in their heart is bitterness. And so when you see them attacking everybody in order to feel good, it's not because that is the approach all the time. But this bitterness in their soul is so much that it's easier for them to pull people down, to kill on people, to hit on people before they feel good. So it's not everything you hear corrosively that is fire. It's not everything you hear corrosively that is God bringing judgment. Some of the excessively corrosive messages you hear and disposition of men is born out of bitterness. They have pains in their heart. People offended them, they were not able to forgive. Especially people with deformities or people that were molested. So you hear when they talk on the subject of rape, the way they will say it, it's not because they are addressing rape. They've not been able to forgive the molestation they suffered. And so they can never be accurate on that ground. So every time they say it, they say it to destroy every other person. That's what can give them succor. Because forgiveness has not yet entered. So these kinds of people, they refuse to let go grudges and they suffer with a lot of inferiority complex. So most of the things they do is pedal through self-preservation. Most times when you find people like this, even the things they acquire, it's not because they need it. It's to make for the soulish injury. You find them buy four cars. They don't need four cars. But until those four cars are there and they snap and put it online and people see it, they will not be happy. You find somebody using four phones. He's, he doesn't need it. But he wants you to know that he's living in abundance. There's an injury in the soul. That's what he's trying to deal with. And if you don't acknowledge what is happening with him, he will be so bitter towards you that he will want to kill you. You can only find peace with him if you massage his ego. You come and call him names. You, you, when you massage his ego, you are his best friend. The day you stand and say, Kai, this is wrong, he can't take it. Because there is this bitterness in his soul. Everything he's doing, is to atone for that bitterness. When you find such people, 
self-preservation will be their philosophy. And they are dangerous people to live with because they can crush you any day, any time without sympathy. If it affects their ego, they will crush you. They will have no sympathy because they are dealing with an internal injury. Number three, pride. These are the vehicles upon which self-preservation rise. People who operate like this, they are the only ones that qualify for success and glory. If it's not them, there's problem. If you find them comfortable and laughing, everything is about godly. That they always want you to see the impression they want you to see. If you see them, it becomes an issue. Pride has ridden those ones deeply. And finally, self-centeredness. Self-preservation rights on it. This is an overwhelming concern about yourself. You are overwhelmingly concerned about yourself. I know it's good to build a house. I know it's good to have some savings. But if you cannot sleep because you have not built a house, something has gone wrong. If you have no savings and you become afraid of living and existence itself, something has gone wrong. That means your value is now in those things, no longer in God. So these kinds of people have an overwhelming concern about themselves and they don't know why. And it's a dangerous position because at that state, the devil can easily take advantage of you. This is why you hear people say, I will do anything to succeed. You, you, you can't do anything to succeed. You will only do what is righteous to succeed. If you get to that point where you will do anything, whatever it takes, ah, that means you are suffering from self-centeredness. You are so afraid of failure that your phobia will make a slave of you. Have you not seen pastors who go to herbalists? Pastors bury virgins so that people can come to church. I thought you are bringing people to church to deliver them. Church itself has become a shrine because the person is too self-centered and overwhelmingly concerned about his success and what he's doing that he has no regard for righteous standards anymore. And when you find these kinds of people, self-preservation is Lord over them. Number two, there are people that easily undermine the feelings of others. Somebody else can die, no problem, so long as I'm comfortable. You will come somewhere. <laughs> if you check yourself where you'll be shocked to. Because you want to sit comfortably in the car and go home. Four other people can trek for three hours. As simple as that is, it doesn't mean anything to you. You cannot afford to share the space in the vehicle with them. Because if they sit with you in that vehicle, they will start thinking that uh, they are something. And so you will rather sit and allow a space that can take three people because you are the head and you will drive home and go and sleep and others will trek and come home three hours later. You are not concerned about their pains. It means nothing to you. Because you want to gather money and start a business in China. You can afford to keep the salary of 100,000 staff. And it doesn't mean anything for you to you. Even if they are crying, it's nothing. You can be the head of a company. Because there is a, a, a savings you want to do in, with your fixed deposit account. The people can go without salary for three months. They should wait. Because you are about to get these savings now. And if you take the money out, you may not get it again. And it doesn't matter if they go hungry, so long as it appears to you. Such people can easily undermine and trivialize the feelings and the pains of other people. And these things happen even in church. It's an oppression of the spirit of the age. I read the story of a man called Andrew Carnegie, one of the first richest billionaires in America. He was into steel business. This guy, the staff, the workers were almost slaves. He will increase hour of work and reduce their salary and go and bribe the mayor. Even when they protest, they will send them back with guns. And he became one of the wealthiest men in America. But at the expense of people's blood, they said 9% of his staff die on duty. 
out of overstretching and hard work and it doesn't matter the dollars just keeps coming if his opponent begin to succeed he will go and damage their reputation and when the business starts going down he will buy it over he doesn't care about anybody he is so vicious that people's feeling mean nothing to him you can sit down in your room and eat with your children and they tell you your neighbor is dying of hunger you say kai the poor you always have how are you able to sleep how are you able to sleep when the next person to you is literally dying our world is so callous now that people have accidents they are dying a car is burning or people are bleeding somebody will carry phone quickly and start going live this is happening now in kogi road ah. somebody is dying you can't help the best thing you can do is you, you, you want them to get live feed. It's happening right now as I'm speaking to you. Oh, I saw one, I, I brushed over one clip, one period. Hey, it's just scattered my, 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 my system immediately. A, what do you call it now? These containers that carry heavy lo loads fell on the car and pressed everybody down and this person kept recording and was like oh Chineke, eh, this is happening now <laughs> I'm like, how are you how did you hold that phone Carlos and if you check his YouTube views is looking for so that at the end of the month they can pay him some dollars because the more they view the more the money have you not seen people who are denting people's reputation today because of YouTube view YouTube view because they know bad news go viral and so they are hunting bad news they don't even check to verify they don't care whether it's true or false so long as it creates more view for more dollars they are up with it it's self-centeredness that's where our world is don't find yourself doing these things before you do anything or take any action ask yourself does this advance God's kingdom and is this God's will for my life? Just in case the teaching is too bogus for you, that is the summary. Before you take any action, make sure it is either for the purpose of impact in the lives of others or it is God's will for your life. If it is not any of these two, be careful before you act because you, are, you may just be on the lane of self-preservation. And if you are a self-preservative person, you are already a puppet in the hands of the devil. If he's not yet using you, it's because he has kept you on the shelf for the best time. The only way to escape self-preservation is to insist that whatever I do must be defined clearly as the will of God for my life. And number two, it must be for impact in the life of others. If that is not the philosophy, then you are a victim. And from this word, you can be rejected and I can assure you a thousand times if all you live for and do is for yourself your reward in heaven is very small the things that provoke eternal reward are things that are in alignment with God's way or for the fortress and development of the life of others in one minute how does God think and what is God's orientation placed against self-preservation in god's context there are three things that defines him number one is self-denial in luke 9 23 i quoted already he said and he said unto them if any man wants to come after me let him carry his cross and follow me in second corinthians 5 15 he said because he died for us we don't live for ourselves anymore we don't live for ourselves we live for the benefit of god and for others and the good news is that when we do that, every other thing we need is now added to us. It says, seek ye first the kingdom, Matthew 6, 33, and his righteousness. It says, all other things shall be added unto you. So a man who is in God's kingdom, functioning by God's philosophy as against the philosophy of the age, his life is defined by self-denial. When others are doing well, he's happy. And when it is God's will, he's happy doing it with the trust and the assurance that god is mindful of him number two the philosophy of the christian is the philosophy of selflessness 
In 1 Corinthians 10, 24, he said, let no man seek his own. He said, but let every man seek another man's wealth. Let every man seek another man's wealth. I know that thing is good for you, but are you the only person who will benefit from it? If you are the only person, then it's not worth it. Whatever it is you want to do, in addition to yourself, let it favor somebody else. If it's always all about you, then you are not kingdom oriented. You are self-centered and you don't know selflessness. Philippians 2 verse 3 to 4, he say, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each of us esteem others more than ourselves. Let everyone esteem others more than himself. And in verse 4 he said, Look not every man on his own thing, but let us look out for the needs of others. That's why Galatians 6, the Bible said, verse 2, he said, bear one another's body and therefore fulfill the law of Christ. And that defines the third philosophy of a kingdom man, sacrifice. You find a kingdom man, self-denial, selflessness, and sacrifice. He said, bear one another's body, fulfill the law of Christ. In 1 John 3, 17, he said, he said, but whoso had this was good and sees his brother have need and shorted his bowel of compassion from him, he said, how can that person say the love of God dwells in him? How can you see your brother in need and you shut out as if it's nothing? He said, you don't know the love of God. And if you don't know the love of God, you are not of God. So a kingdom man is a man that operates by the principle of self-denial. A kingdom man is a man that operates by the principle of selflessness. And a kingdom man is a man that operates by the principles of sacrifice. You may not quote all the scriptures. But if you live like this, you are a better Christian than... <laughs> this man is telling me to be careful because uh, the next generation is coming. <laughs> My God! The apostle came up immediately. What do you mean? How can you say only one person is standing up and talking sins? Is he the only person in this place? Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. So it's important for you to know that you qualify to receive only after you have given. It's important for you to know that you qualify for mercy after you have shown mercy. And it's important for you to know that you qualify for forgiveness after you are forgiven. Because the principle of the kingdom is self-denial, selflessness and sacrifice meanwhile it's important for me to let you know that what we are saying here is not self neglect we are not saying your life should become a ridicule and a waste that's not what we are saying but we are saying that the degree to which you love yourself is the degree to which you must love others if it is good enough for you it is good enough for another person so what we are advocating is not self-neglect. What we are advocating is actually an all-inclusive doctrine that you treat others the way you want to be treated. Number two, what we are advocating is not a lack of prudence because a lot of people hear things like this and they no longer plan their lives. They live carelessly and when you ask them, they say it's self-denial. That's not the way of the kingdom. The way of the kingdom has to do with meticulous planning because you are effective to the degree of your planning. You cannot throw all your money away and say, I'm giving to the poor. That's not what we are saying. There is a portion for, to which you give to the poor. There is a portion you give to God. There is a portion you invest in order to develop yourself and be more effective in doing what you are doing so that there is sustainability. Are we together? So it's not lack of, of self, it's not self-neglect. And it's not lack of prudence. And also it's not lack of planning. Make sure that your life is lived to the full. God is interested in your well-being as much as he's interested in others. And God is not saying destroy yourself in a bid to help others. God is actually saying as you take care of yourself in the same vein, take care of others. As you look out for yourself in the same vein, look out for others. If you don't live like this, then the spirit of the age has taken over you. One of the operation of the spirit of the age is self-preservation. And more than 90% of us are living for self-preservation. David said, I will not build a house for myself when the house of the Lord is in ruins. 
Does that mean David said he won't build the house? No, it's good to build the house. But the same way I need a house, that's how God also needs a house. That's the principle. Are we together? Are we together? Once in a while, take a good dress. Look at a brother who doesn't have. If you can't give him money to buy, share the one you have with him. Give him the dress, let him also look good. And when he wears that dress and looks good, be happy that you have improved the quality of somebody's life. Once in a while, when you have to spare, take out of what you have and share with somebody. And say, oh, I've noticed that you in, in, for a long time now, you've been tracking, you've been this, this. I want to support you. In love and with respect, you do that. Because you are also mindful of other people. If your life is all about yourself, your life is very small. If you want to really become big and impactful, then you must begin to think about others. Bow your heads as we pray. Ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to help you. If you check now, check your life in a moment. In the last four months, how many helpless people have you helped? Have you fed anybody apart from your family members in the last three months? Can you remember one, two, or three persons that ate food because of you? That is not your immediate family. In the last three months, can you remember somebody that changed, had a change of raiment or is wearing something good because of you who is not part of your family? When was the last time you bought clothes for someone? When was the last time you fed someone? I know things are not all rosy with you. But at least you have enough to have change of raiment. You have three, you have four, you have five, you have six, you have seven garments. You have been speaking in tongues. Have you given somebody a dress in the last four months? You have been speaking in tongues. Have you caused somebody who is hungry to eat food in the last three months? Who is not your blood? We have become irresponsible to our world. And that's why the devil is having a few days. When was the last time? somebody somebody's money increased because you gave and that person is not related to you by blood if these things don't happen our speaking in tongues is fake our quoting of scripture is fake that religion that does not remember his brother is not of god and this is why the sons of the bond woman are growing so rapidly because they can do anything for their faith. In my estate where I live, there is an al -Haji. Every evening, and I'm not saying once in a week, every evening, people finish work and they just go there. They will cook food. I'm not saying do it. That's his capacity and that's his faith. They will cook food, food, and keep it. Strangers, you will see wheelbarrow pushers, truck pushers, they will come and eat, wash their hands and go home. There is a fridge outside, they, there are taps outside, you wash, eat and go. They don't need to ask your name. No matter where you come from, if you are hungry, at least in the evening, the man has something so that you don't sleep with hunger. And he has done it for years, I've been in that estate. And then we, all we do is prayer work. We are walking out the estate and praying in tongues, we will take over this estate. We will take over. We will take over. He will. <laughs> if that man starts a mosque there, if he starts a mosque there, that mosque will grow more than a church of 30 prayer warriors. Our Christianity is self-centered and self-oriented. And if God does not deliver us, we can't take this word. We are too selfish for God to commit kingdom to us. Do you know how much prayer time is required to advance kingdom? How many of us can pray for Nigeria for one hour every day? There are 168 hours in a week. If you are praying for Nigeria every day, that is seven hours out of 168 hours. And then you are shouting that there must be a change. How many of us can go out for one hour every week and say, I want to talk to somebody about Jesus and improve the person's quality of living? How many of us can give 10% of our income and say, no, I want to advance God's kingdom. Any
any other anywhere it mustn't be where you come to fellowship i see what is happening here i see what is happening there i believe in it i want to sponsor it so that good can be done to someone hey, hey. something many years ago that shook me we were leaders in church and then some of us were just preparing for youth service and you know how life can be at that level all we had was speaking in tongues and so winning a brother came to church one of the serious cell leaders and he didn't have school fees and he met one of the big guys as fellow cell leaders to please support him with school fees. What was he looking for? 15,000 to top school fees. Ah, the brother said, Kai, he wish he had. But God will provide and prophesied. We entered leaders meeting the next moment. Pastor stood up and said, we have not completed our target for this month. And he pointed the brother and said, big guys like you are here. Where is your faith? The guy said, Pastor, wait, wait, wait. I will give 500,000. Uh -uh. The man just beat on his ego. That means the, that ego will not die. They keep it there and use it as a monitor, monitor of extracting money. Uh -uh. You have 500,000. And somebody, a fellow brother, is about to be kicked from school for school fees. And what he needs is 15,000. Because they touch your ego. 500,000 has come out. And why is that so? Number one, they hail them as the men of faith. Because those days, you, if, those who give money are those who have faith. And then number two, at the end of the year, they will honor them as big partners. They will give them medals. But you are receiving medals and your conscience is dead. So that giving is not God. It's self. That's the Christianity I'm talking about. Ask the Lord to help you. One minute. Ask the Lord. Ask the Lord to help you. Ask the Lord to help you. That you will open our understanding, awaken our conscience, and cause us to walk in love in its purity and genuineness. Thank you, Father, because beyond these words, you will encounter us and help us. The fear that makes us want to live for ourselves, may it be withdrawn. The ambition that makes us want to live independent of you, may it be withdrawn. The pride and the ego that makes us want to, want to live to prove a point, may it be withdrawn. Have mercy. Let grace be supplied even tonight. And as we walk out of this door, we walk out as completely new entities in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. <laughs> Please sit down for a moment. Sit down for a moment. I want you to take these words to heart. Um, some of you 
you may be at that point where things are not really rosy. Some of you may, are, you may be at that point where you have been bastardized while growing up. Some people may be here who were raped. Some people may be here who were bullied when they were young. This is not taught to accuse you or to make you feel bad. But this is taught to let you know that if you don't take advantage of grace quickly, the devil can take advantage of that and exploit you. And I also want you to know that whatever it is you went through while coming up, there were people who went through the same and they sought God and God has empowered them and they are empowering others. I know a woman called Joyce Meyer abused while coming up. Today she has lifted over thousands of people who were abused. So if you choose not to remain there and you ask for help, God can help you. And just in case you are part of those who were bullied, molested, isolated, and you want to reach out, you can reach out at any time. The little with which God has helped us, we are willing to extend the pastoral hand of care and pull you out of that pit. Please don't be afraid. You are not a bad person. You are a victim and the devil is taking advantage of it, but today help us come. And so for everyone that has a soulish injury, I speak healing over that place in the name of Jesus. As you go home, the Lord will give you an encounter that will deliver you from your fears, deliver you from bitterness and vanity, and you will walk in the true essence of the love of the Father. So let it be written, and so let it be established in Jesus' precious name. See you again on Sunday. Thank you for coming. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description call us and let us lead you to receive jesus christ as your lord and personal savior and lastly make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded you can be notified thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section bye